So welcome everyone to this first community call in May. Um, we have three community calls in May, and this is the first of them, and this is our third of May community call. And I will click on the agenda slide we have here. So the agenda we have today is that Hal is going to do a demo from the resiliency feature that we shipped in the V1.7 release from two weeks ago. If you'd like to go back to our previous recording, we extensively covered all the features in that release, but we thought we'll just add an interesting demo for the resiliency uh, at this time, because it will be good to see how that works in action. And then most of this call, we're going to touch on three different proposals. These are all future looking proposals, things that we'd like the community to have input on, have discussion about. And so all of these are still in a matter of you know, fleshing out the details. And we feel as if this is a great time to talk through some of those in detail, get a chance for the community to give us some feedback and input in them and decide how important they are and which direction they should take. So we'll have your own we'll talk about extending service invocation to non dapper endpoints. We'll have Alessandro talk about a new building block proposed building block API for cryptography. And we'll have Art to talk about the ability to support batching for send and receive in pub sub messages to improve performance. And then at the end, we'll follow, follow up with an open discussion where you can ask any question that you want of your choice. So before we switch over to Hal, I just wanted to point out that one thing that's very useful is that to understand is that our planning process is at this point in time is that we are in the process of developing the V1.8 release. And you can see in this issue inside here in the Dapper Dapper repo, issue number 4513, that the dates for the release have been set. You know, these are provisional dates that we intend to hit in terms of code freeze, in terms of when the end game starts and release date. Um, you can see the individual milestones for each one of the different repos and the maintainers pull in the issues that they think are relevant to go and just release this milestone. And then generally there's been a discussion down here and then a summary of the main features that will come at least from the runtime repo, from components contrib, and then from the SDKs. So I encourage you to take a look through these, give feedback against these, as well as the proposals we're about to go to today, um, because these are features that are actively being developed right now. And it's super important that we get your input to them and, and contributions towards them as well. So please check that out and you know, give us some feedback on that. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Hal. All right, let me share my screen. Uh, do this, and then make sure I get the right desktop. This one. All right, can uh, people see my terminal? Yes. Yep. Awesome. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick demo on uh, a few resiliency things, uh, or I guess one specific thing. Um, I understand that Nick gave a overview of resiliency in the um, in the previous uh, community call. Um, so what you're going to see here is me failing to type. Um, is I have two apps, uh, one of which is going to be generating data, and one of which is going to be analyzing data. The analyzer doesn't actually do anything, and the generator is generating nonsense. But um, what I wanted to show here is uh, the circuit breaker feature of of resiliency because um, it's a bit of a less I think understood feature, um, but also a really powerful one. Um, so I'm gonna start my app here. Um, it's using actors and reminders to generate some data. So every 10 seconds, it's gonna generate some stuff and then kick off a pub sub and it's gonna hit the top app there. And um, kind of what I'm simulating is, you know, let's say that in my production scenario, I deployed this analyzer app after I made some updates to it and you know, I can see now that, oh, look, I got 17 items and then 19 items. It's only supposed to be getting one item. Maybe I wrote my query wrong. Um, so I'm simulating like, like a query failure here. And then what I have is I have um, a circuit breaker that's actually over my state store here. Um, and basically what this is going to do is that when we start seeing errors on the um, on writing to the state store, I'm using Cosmos DB. Um, our circuit breaker is going to start stopping our traffic. Um, so this should start failing fairly shortly. And what we're also going to see here is that at first, I'm actually running this without any resiliency. So what we're going to see is um, 
a whole bunch of failures um, and we're going to start getting uh, too many request exceptions back from Cosmos. So basically what we're going to start seeing is, you know, we're flooding our Cosmos DB database with requests that are always going to fail. Um, it's just going to be causing, you know, huge amounts of traffic. It can start causing outages for other sections of my application. Um, it's going to drive up your bill because you're doing requests that you don't need. You're like, and here you go. So you can see um, the request rate is too large. So, you know, we started our failures and what we're going to see here is that the generator is going to keep going and every time we're just going to keep seeing those, those failures. Um, so now let's stop this really quick um, and kill that. And then what I'm going to do is um, resiliency is a preview feature. So I'm going to be using a configuration that enables resiliency. We'll let everything get started up again. Wait for it to finish starting. Actually, it's already is. Um, and then we'll restart our generation here. So now what we're going to see here is um, the first one's going to go. We're going to get all of our failures again. Now on the second request, what we'll see is that we actually won't get any failures anymore um, because instead we'll see um, this. The circuit breaker is open. Um, so if we go back to our policy, what, we'll, what we see here is it's looking for consecutive failures greater than one. So we just got a bunch of failures. Um, they exploded the circuit breaker, so it's now open. Um, it has a timeout of 60 seconds and a max request of one. So what that means is that um, for 60 seconds, the circuit breaker is going to be fully open and it's not going to let through any traffic. Um, after 60 seconds, it's going to let through one request and see how that request does. Um, if it succeeds, it'll close the circuit breaker. If it uh, fails, it'll reopen the circuit breaker. Um, so basically, uh, when we go back to our terminal here, so we can see that we just keep hitting circuit breaker is open, um, which means that this entire time we're getting no traffic to our Cosmos DB. Um, and this is only happening for this application here. Um, so, you know, all of my other apps um, can still do everything. You know, my generator can still generate data. You can see here, this, this is the attempt at, uh, at uh, trying it again. Um, and this is all in a big threaded area. So it's just shooting off all the requests at once. That's why you see a bunch of messages. Um, but you see circuit breaker is now open again. Um, so, you know, my other, my generator can still generate to can still hit cosmos db i can still process those things later i'm not you know this one broken app isn't impacting my entire system because of the circuit breaker um so that's just kind of what i wanted to show um does anyone have any questions on that no this is super cool so the whole idea of these resiliency policies is that it you know as you said that kind of mm -hmm. helps you saves you some costs and saves you hitting the cosmos db in this case and, yep. and of course, you can apply these across all the different types of components and. Yeah, exactly. So like um, this state circuit breaker here is configured once um, and you can see um, like I use it right here um, down in this for this target component. Um, but like you could use that across all of your different uh, all of your different uh, state stores and, and it's also supported for other building blocks um, and you only need to define it once you can then everything can just reference it so like you can get really nice uniform behavior across your entire app um, with just the one uh, implementation here so it's pretty nice excellent stuff all right cool cool thank you for sure I'll, yeah, I'll pass it back all right let me uh, share my screen now. So, I think I'm up next. Oh, you're up next. So yes, next yeah. up we will have your own talking about his proposal or the proposal to extend service invocation to non dap HTTP endpoints. So, yep. Uh, before that, uh, really great presentation, Hal. You know, we're we're showing that demo um, and uh, a pretty elaborate explanation of, of the problem that it solves throughout all of the um, capabilities that he provides in KubeCon uh, later this month. So that's really great. And what I like about this the most is that uh, unlike, for example, service meshes, which allow you to put resiliency policies on meshed services, which work really well for service to service calls, this really allows you to put these breakers and timeouts and all of these policies for your infrastructure dependencies 
uh, whether they're databases or pub subs or bindings. So that's really great. And the demo showed it really well. Um, but then I've already seen this demo, so I'm kind of biased, but I, I like it every time I see it. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Let me know when you can see it. We can see it. All right, cool. So we're going to talk about extending the existing service invocation to non-dapper uh, HTTP endpoints. Uh, but before we talk about, you know, um, how this is going to uh, be done or how this is going to look like, we need to talk about the why. So Dapper today has something that's called an HTTP binding, um, which I personally don't like at all. And I'm saying it as its author. I wrote it three years ago, back when I was young and at Microsoft. Um, but basically what the HTTP binding allows you to do is use Dapper to invoke non-dapperized endpoints, but still take advantage of things like telemetry and now uh, some form of resiliency policies that apply to bindings. But there's many different issues with HTTP binding, and these have actually been pointed out by the larger community for years now, really. Um, and uh, lately I've been seeing more and more users uh, surfacing up these issues, and I think it's, it's time we did something about that. And so the major uh, first issue that I'm going to talk about is that there is no support for middleware, um, because middleware, of course, is a separate Dapper components. Dapper components do not know of each other. Uh, they don't, they're, they're all introverts. You can think of Dapper components like introverts. They don't know each other. They don't want to know each other. They all live in their same bubble. They stay in their house and they never come out. Um, same thing for middleware and, and you know bindings. So uh, if you're using a binding, the whatever transformation that that middleware uh, component is going to do for your request, that's not going to be carried over to your HTTP binding, and that's a problem. Also, there's obviously no support for ACLs because ACL is a service invocation feature, so you can't enforce that on bindings. Um, of course, there's not support for many HTTP semantics. If you know the HTTP binding, um, you have a very limited list of um, HTTP verbs that it supports. There's you know, no support for trailers. It's, it's a very far removed type of HTTP implementation that, that really limits you in what you're trying to do. Uh, and then the, maybe the, the most annoying thing in my opinion is that it has a really opinionated programming model. Meaning if, if your code basically just wrote an, an HTTP call using an HTTP client in whatever language you use, um, you're gonna need to basically transform all of your code just to use this HTTP binding uh, and basically um, tell Dapper how you want the, the call to look like um, using a JSON, which I'm gonna show in a second and you'll, you'll realize what's kind of broken about it. Uh, and then of course for operators and developers, you need to create a component per base URL. So if you're calling several URLs, you actually need to duplicate the component for every URL that you want to call. Um, each one of these issues is pretty big in its own right, but you know, combining all of these together, uh, the HTTP binding just isn't something that you know I and not just me, but other users think is is really viable. And so today, if you want to use an HTTP binding, what you need to do is create this YAML here, uh, which has a spec of um, Bindings HTTP, it's pretty simple. Then you have the metadata and you basically need to hard code the, the base URL into the component here. So for example, here I'm calling orders.com. If I were to call um, my cool orders.com, I would need a second component. And now then the next step after I define this component is basically to call Dapper. So let's say the target endpoint uh, is, is a get endpoint or you know a delete endpoint. But in this case, let's, let's say it's a get endpoint the user basically cannot just use an HTTP client and issue a get call. They need to issue a post call into the Dapper endpoint and they can't just use any URL that they want. They have to break up the URL into two pieces. So the first piece of the URL, which is the base URL is being put inside of the value field here in the YAML component. And then if you have a fragmented path, you need to specify that in the metadata section uh, in, in the path here, which you can see on step two. So for example, if you wanted to call heporders.com slash checkout slash 100, you'd need to break this up. And this is extremely unnatural in an HTTP call. So you have actually three URLs here. Um, you have the base URL, you have the additional path uh, on the call itself, and then you're calling Dapper for, for the binding. And then if you want things like headers, you can just put headers on the call. You need to uh, supply them on the metadata itself. And this is just a part of the, of the problem. What I'm not showing here is how headers are getting um, 
put back into your application. So Dapper won't just return the, the native HTTP call. Um, it'll create specialized headers on the response that Dapper makes to your app that you need to inspect with uh, very specific headers that map the HTTP call headers to how Dapper thinks you should uh, be extracting those. And this creates a very uh, frictionful operation of these HTTP components. And then of course, you know, there's the, the rest of the issues that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so no support for ACLs, uh, no support for middleware, of course, per model is, is a major rewrite. And then uh, creating these components for every URL you need to make is quite problematic. And so what we can do is actually um, extend service invocation uh, to just support uh, non-Dapper HTTP endpoints, which basically means having service invocation with Dapper, but removing the discovery aspect of it. So what this will do is it'll enable middleware, it'll enable ACLs, uh, it'll let you use the same HTTP semantics as Dapper uses for service to service invocation. So there is nothing smelly there. And it's the same proxy like HTTP program model that you get with Dapper today. Uh, meaning you can either use the, the Dapper API for invoke or you can use the, the header based method. Now I'm gonna show in a sec. So we're basically turning uh, this into this. Uh, and this is just one example of a, a uh, possible uh, implementation of it. So you basically curl and we're curling the orders.com method where we don't need to make a post or, or a delete request or anything. We just use whatever uh, native HTTP verb uh, the target URL uh, contains. And instead of providing Dapper with a Dapper app ID header, uh, telling Dapper to discover the service inside of a cluster using a name resolution component, here we're basically telling Dapper, hey, this is the target URL that I want to call. And then the call to Dapper just becomes a uh, localhost uh, 3500, um, which is uh, very, very simple. So this becomes uh, extremely simple compared to this. You don't have any YAMLs to maintain. You don't have any special rewrite that you need to make. Uh, there is nothing special you need to do. You get all of the HTTP semantics that are supported and you get ACLs and middleware and telemetry and resiliency policies. Uh, that are all working for service-to-service -service invocation today. Um, for anyone who, who knows how Dapper operates internally, uh, I'll just mention that uh, this basically just skips the service invocation, the service discovery part, and it uh, goes directly to what Dapper defines as an app channel. So an app channel is something that Dapper uses to invoke the, the applications channel, and that can be very easily reused. Um, of course, uh, this, this has some other major benefits in that it's very much unlike what a service mesh does. So Dapper service invocation today uh, doesn't use service mesh semantics like um, TCP proxying, uh, which hurt performance. They, they have a, a pretty bad performance benefits. Um, and so this really allows you to use the existing Dapper semantics um, with, with external endpoints without sacrificing performance or uh, really anything like that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stop here and open it up for questions. Well, what do you think are some of the classic use cases of doing this? I mean, what sort of endpoints are the sort of targets that you're looking for? Um, so the, the use cases that uh, other users have brought up for this is that they want to call external services, but still get the same benefits that they get with service invocations. For example, they want to call an HTTP service that they don't necessarily control, but they want to be able to apply resiliency policies to it or be able to trace it with telemetry without needing to pull in all of the telemetry SDKs. Um, or uh, they want to be able to see metrics for it, you know, request per seconds, latency, uh, all of that stuff that the Dapper gives them. So basically layering all of the Dapper added features that you get with service invocation, but for services that uh, they don't necessarily control. And that includes just APIs that you yep. might have. So say you wanted to get a weather API, just as a random example, and get the weather information and pull it down. You know, And it today I'd have to have used the HTTP binding if I wanted to call that from a Dapper app, I could just call that weather API directly. Correct, yeah. Um, I, um... I had like a slight different uh, perspective on the on, on the proposal initially. Um, so I do I do I have thought about this problem before. So I think there's value in this type of feature where you're calling a service, but the service is remote, it's not it's not local. Um, but I like if we can have a solution where the URL is not defined by the application. 
like the application says calls the order service. And um, I wonder if all the URL extra, uh, authentication headers or any other uh, uh, default parameters uh, for the request could be defined maybe even via new CRD, uh, where we call, let's say, external service CRD, for example. So this way, the API will still work the same way for service invocation, but if the name of the service matches one of those external services resources, we skip the DNS resolution and we use the this 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 external call. Um, I will I will make a comment if you have a, a issue for this. Um, yeah, there is an issue, and yeah, I, I mean this this also makes sense. I mean uh, this this type of um, mapping between your desired URL to to an external entity using like external configuration is certainly viable. And yeah, we can we can definitely take take a look at this, and you know also allow overrides on the call itself. So you, you, you could use like an, an external configuration or not, depending on what works best for you. But yeah, that's, that's certainly doable. Doug, you have your hand up and uh, I'll allow, allow you to speak. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, so Jaron, I know you mentioned some possible performance issues with meshes and stuff like that, but what strikes me about this is um, it seems like you're coming awfully close to doing a mesh just without doing a mesh. And at some point someone's gonna say, why aren't you just sort of, accepting fate, right? And just say, okay, meshes have a lot of these same features. Why aren't we just using a mesh? Why require the user to go through any hoops at all, right? Why not just intercept all up on requests? And if it's destined for something that we want to muck with, then we muck with it. Otherwise, we just let it through. Yeah, that's that's a general question about, you know, Dapper with service meshes in general for service invocation. And mm -hmm. the answer to that is no different than uh, the answer we, we basically give to all users. Um, if you're using a service mesh today, then yeah, but, I mean, by all means, um, do not use Dapper for service invocation. If you don't want to use Dapper for state, pub sub configuration, all of the other stuff, and use a mesh. But you know, something that um, all users of service meshes will tell you in many times, it's such a big operational overhead that uh, if you're using Dapper already and you're not using any special features of service mesh, like for example, traffic shaping, then you don't need a mesh to do it. And so if they're already using Dapper, adding a mesh just to do that external invocation of an HTTP service is going to be too big of a cross to bear for them. And uh, this is the same logic that applies to Dapper service invocation today with service meshes and applying this uh, to external services um, doesn't really change that uh, decision making process in my opinion. So just, just to sum it up, if you're using Dapper in a service mesh today, yeah, you can use either Dapper or the service mesh depending on which fe features you use from the service mesh. If you're not using a service mesh, I think it's really valuable to not have users be needing to install service messages just to have these external calls. It'd be really beneficial. Yeah, I, I can understand. Yeah, yeah, I, I can understand the argument. It's just I think I would come to a different conclusion. I would say rather than um, saying, "Okay, we're going to give you a different mechanism to do it," I would say, "Okay, we're just going to create a service mesh light." Right, and only give you the features that Dapper thinks are important. Because I think even though I agree with you, what you showed is definitely a whole lot less work for users, right? Because the, the original th three-step thing that you showed was, was quite cumbersome and the new one is definitely a lot easier, but it is still a significant change to the code in my opinion. And if you could do a service mesh light to give you just the features that Dapper thinks is important, then there's no code changes. And I think that might have some appeal to people. So just something to think about. Yeah, I mean, we, we did discuss this in the past uh, pretty much whether, you know, we want to go through the uh, network sniffing route or not. Um, there was a pretty big consensus um, with Dapper maintainers, the community and the steering committee that uh, we, we don't want to go through the IP table route. So, um, but, you know, if you want to bring this issue back up, um, I encourage you to create an issue on, on Dapper Dapper. Um, and then, you know, we can, uh, we, we can discuss it there. Because this okay. is this is a, a change that's bigger than this proposal. Um, you're basically saying, hey, for service invocation in general, um, just you know use uh, IP table filtering uh, instead of calling directly to the Dapper APIs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And okay. that essentially means making Dapper a de facto service mesh. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, some great. Uh, ideas there and some great feedback. So with that, I am going to share my screen here and hopefully you should be able to see my screen now. And we yep. are now going to go on to the next proposal, which is about a proposal on a building block API for cryptography. Alessandro. Yes. Yeah, can you go to the next slide, please? 
Okay, so just quick disclaimer, you hear me saying crypto, I always mean cryptography. I don't, I'm not talking about anything else that you might be talking, you thinking about when you think about crypto. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, there's a, I wanna start from like a, some scenarios. So you see a few things here and what do they have in common? Like, uh, um, for example, encrypting something like a row in a database or a file before you store that in a state store, or maybe signing a message, like signing an email, you might have heard of S-MIME, um, signing an update, like uh, if you're operating the App Store, you always sign all the downloads, make sure that the software is genuine, or uh, even more like 2022-ish problems, like uh, COVID vaccine certificates. Uh, those who are familiar with the EU green passes, for example, they all use digital signatures. Um, you might also be issuing JOT tokens that are self-contained uh, session tokens where you can maintain your session data, uh, encrypting chat messages, uh, managing TLS certificates or issuing new ones. So all of the above, they all rely on crypto keys and uh, crypto keys are a special kind of secret. Um, right now you can do uh, secrets with Dapper and you store them in a secret store. And then at the runtime, your application fetches the secret when it starts, for example, and then keeps it in memory for uh, the lifetime of that service. Um, this, is, this is fine, this works, but it does have some issues, including the fact, first of all, that the application in this case needs to actually know the secret. So at that, at that point, it's not really a secret anymore if the application can see that. Um, so the, this can be especially bad for keys. And the other thing is that the key in this case is stored in memory in the process. And so uh, that has other concerns in the fact that you have to be a lot more careful about what you're doing with the key and making sure you're protecting your memory. So uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So last slide, um, a proposal for a new Dapper building block for cryptography. Uh, so one of the things that I love about Dapper today is that it abstracts a lot of different external components, like we abstract state stores or secret stores. Uh, so you have a consistent API and uniform that allows you to access these services that have their own individual APIs. So just like we're doing that, uh, it would be great if we could also abstract the Key Vault services. Uh, think of things like Azure Key Vault, AWS KMS, Google Cloud KMS, and similar services from other cloud providers or even on-prem uh, solutions like I believe Tails is offering an on-prem um, vault uh, appliance. Um, these vaults not only store your keys, but sometimes they can also store them in hardware security modules or HSMs. So no one can extract the private keys in any situation. Like your keys are safe and not even the owner of the cloud computing platform can see what the keys are. Um, for those who are running on-prem on or just in any Kubernetes, we could also allow storing keys as Kubernetes secrets. So only Dapper would, uh, would access the keys and your application would just interface with Dapper to uh, perform operations in those, uh, with those keys. Um, here, the goal is that the application never sees the keys. So they never leave the vault, whether that's a cloud service vault like HSM or even just uh, the Dapper sidecar. Um, this significantly reduces the risk that the keys may be exposed and there's full separation of concerns. So the crypto officer in your team can rotate keys and they are the only ones that can know what the keys are and no one else inside the company, not your developers, no one else can uh, need to see the keys. Um, another benefit is that Dapper can expose only safe crypto primitives. So we can disallow the usage of unsafe algorithms or modes of operation. Uh, if you think about common mistakes when using cryptography, think about AES using ECB mode. That is really bad, uh, but it's the, you, you need to have some experience to understand why you should not do that. So in Dapper, we could just disallow anything that is unsafe and make developers' life a little bit easier. Uh, we can enforce minimum key sizes. We can ensure that we rely on safe um, uh, pseudo, num pseudo random number generators, et cetera. Um, we should be able to cover all of the major crypto primitives with a key that are offered by key vault services, such as what Azure and AWS offer. It includes encrypting and decrypting data. We can both do that with symmetric ciphers like AES and uh, uh, ChaCha20, Poly1305. Uh, or we can also support uh, asymmetric ciphers like uh, RSA and maybe even things like uh, ECIES if we feel like doing that. Um, 
We can offer the, the ability to wrap and unwrap keys like with ICE KeyW. It's a special variant of AES for, that is specifically optimized for keys. And we can sign messages with RSA, uh, ECDSA that uses the NIST curves, and maybe even EDDSA if we want to support Bernstein style curves. Um, what's, not mi what's missing here is very fine signatures because generally that does not require working with private keys, but we can still offer that as well as an extra component. So the, the proposal right now is very high level and I'm mostly seeking feedback from people in the community. Uh, but uh, um, the idea is that this can benefit developers because we want to make sure that developers are allowed, uh, not allowed, sorry, they're able to use cryptography with, with safe primitives and they can come in handy a lot when you're dealing with compliance. Think of like financial regulations, GDPR, et cetera. This will incre increase your, uh, um, decrease your burden to comply with these regulations. And we can also standardize the different APIs of all these services like Azure, Amazon's, Google's, et cetera. So this makes applications portable and they allow you to use HSMs, which are safer in a, in a, in a safer way. So before I open for question, also one thing only, um, this is not, the proposal here is mostly about crypto primitives, and this is not about uh, offering a complete end-to-end -end, uh, um, or turnkey solution for things like end-to-end -end encryption. Um, this is beyond the scope. There was already some conversation on that in the GitHub issue that I can post a link to. And uh, something that is more turnkey opinionated is beyond the scope right now. This just focuses on the primitives and then developers have to use them in the way they see most fit. So any question? Yeah, this is a super interesting proposal. I think that, uh, I think you think it's gonna be interesting to talk about, you know, today Dapper's secret APIs that you can get hold of just a secret. Would they have any relationship at all in terms of using them together or not really? Um, you definitely can put them together. Um, I see keys as a special kind of secrets where um, they're special in two ways. One, because if you can avoid your application accessing the raw key material, it's best. Like the least you expose keys to your application, the better it is. And also keys are used in specific ways only. And so you can have a vault actually performing operation on the keys. Like rather than getting, giving the key to your application and then having your application encrypt the data with that key, you can just send the data to the, uh, to the vault service and have that perform the operation with the key stored possibly in an HSM. So that's just by, by way of another example, for example, we built a feature into Dapper today that uh, allows you to do encryption of the state for the state management and it uses a key that gets generated for you. Instead of generating that key, this could store that key that it uses inside a vault and retrieve it each time you try to encrypt or decrypt that data. Yes, although you wouldn't be retrieving the key. You will be encrypting the data with the key stored in vault. So the, the key never leaves the vault. Uh, it just, you send that raw data to the vault and the vault gives you back the encrypted data. Correct, I see. That's a good way of putting it, yes. There's a, Adam has a, the, has he signed up? I think, Phil, you had a question. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, how would you see configuration for this working in the sense of, let's say I was using Azure and AWS to co-locate um, my services. How would you see the underlying actors de delineating and understanding what crypto uh, backend to use for that? Would you be stuck using a single one or would how would you be able to, to to, to broadly use this? So the idea would be to create a building block just like you have the secret store, for example, and you define a, a CRD that says, I, I want this secret store named uh, Foo to be backed by um, Azure Keyword Secret Store. So you would have a, a, the same way you would have a key store or key provider or crypto provider, whatever we want to call it, uh, that is called uh, X and is backed by Amazon. And then you would have another one called Y that is backed by Azure. And another one called Z that is backed by keys stored locally in, uh, uh, in a Kubernetes secret store. Uh, and, uh, um, and then your application would just invoke the, uh, invoke the, tell Dapper essentially which provider to use just like you're using different secret stores or different state stores. Does that gotcha. make sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely awesome, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so I just kind of rephrase it as a component model. Yeah, it's a component for each one of those types of uh, different backing key stores. 
So I can switch between them. So I can say encrypt this data and it sends it to Azure Key Vault or encrypt this data and sends it to AWS KMS. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And the and the APIs you have on the screen here, there would be like encrypt, decrypt, and you know, using the, the, the named key that of, of as part of the request. Correct. Uh, some services have differences, like for example, I don't believe any service today supports ChaCha 20, Poly 1305. Uh, for, uh, um, East, uh, for Azure, for example, elliptic curves are only supported if you're using HSM, but not in the standard tier. So there will be some differences, like some operations will not be allowed everywhere, uh, just like we do with like state stores. Not every operation is allowed everywhere, but um, we should be able to abstract as much as possible. Yeah, so say I wanted to build a safe uh, in, um, encryption app, a, a, chat map, a chat messaging application that did encryption of all my data, I would basically say, call the encrypt API, get back the encrypted data, send that on the wire, you know, using you know, service invocation, you know, that I could encrypt that data. And at the other end, the, when I received a message in my app, I could call back onto Dapper and then decrypt it with the same, with, with the same API call going to the, the, the same key store. Correct. Um, now, um, Mark, you're just bringing up like one, one important point that this is only about the primitives. Like if you want to do what you're describing, like um, private messaging end-to-end -end encrypted, there's a lot more that you have to worry about. Like how do you make sure that the application you're sending a message to is exactly the, the application they claim to be? Yes. Um, so there's, there's a lot more things about like uh, uh, public key management or like certificate stuff like that. This just helps with the primitives. You still have to build something on top, depending on what your requirements are. But still goes a long way to helping you do that. Yes. And Arthur has his hand up. Um, yeah. Uh, so if I understand correctly, uh, the only thing that is saved uh, would be the the keys, right? Not necessarily the payload encrypted or decrypted. Correct. So. Um, Obviously, like let's say you're using Azure Key Vault to, uh, to keep your keys, you will and you're encrypting something, you would still have to send the raw data to Azure Key Vault, which does see your raw uh, plain text data. Um, you just have to trust that they're not storing it. And to my oh. understanding, they're not, uh, but that would be the goal. Um, if you have concerns in the, with the fact that you're not allowed to even send the data to Azure Key Vault, that's why there's things like wrapping and unwrapping keys that you can use. So you encrypt the data locally, you use a random key, and then you just send this key to Azure Key Vault to be wrapped. Uh, and that's another way. But it, again, we, this idea is just for crypto primitives, and it's not about an end-to-end -end, uh, opinionated solution, at, at least not yet. Is there, so I understand. So if there is like, uh, for example, in Secret Store today, there is the local flavor of it where you get the secrets from a, a environment variable or JSON file. So in this case, would it be possible to also have like a, a built-in local uh, en encryption uh, implementation where you could um, have a local key either via Kubernetes or via local file that you can encrypt the crypt locally without having to use any cloud service? Yes, that would be the local keys proposal that you see in the second bullet point. Okay. Um, I consider that as a second class option, just because the key in that case is not stored in a in a proper vault. And you know, like um, things like Azure Key Vault or AWS KMS, they are even FIPS certified, so you get next level of security. But it is an option. Yeah, yeah just just because um, it is it is one of the uh, values value proposition of Dapper is to make the development lifecycle easier so you can run your application locally without having to uh, have cloud services uh, uh, credentials. So, but yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I, I, uh, sorry, just a uh, feedback from me. I really like this proposal. Uh, I think we should continue on discussions on GitHub, but uh, basically I think this can be really valuable for Dapper users. Yeah, I think so too. I think the, the call to action, then it would be love to hear of scenarios people would use this in. Is everything is, you know, and if people could comment on in the GitHub issue or where they think this would become useful, because that would kind of provide more weight to it then in terms of importance and also providing use cases around it all. All right, with that, let us move on um, to talk about the next proposal, the support of batching in send and receive for pub sub messages. So, Arthur. Okay. 
Uh, thanks, Mark. So let me lower my hand here. Okay. So uh, that has been a really old ask. I think it's been over two years um, where we can support micro batching in Dapper Pups up, uh, either also to send, but also to receive. Can you, uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, the proposal uh, at the high level is that you can send a batch of messages here to the Dapper sidecar and the Dapper sidecar will receive that batch of messages and deliver them in a batch to the cloud service as well. Uh, the same thing for the subscribe, that you could subscribe uh, via your broker uh, in, in Dapper sidecar, you could consume a batch of messages and get this, the batch delivered to your application as well. Um, but you could also receive a batch from the cloud service, but receive each message individually to the application, but do that in parallel. Today, some components already support the, the scenario at the bottom where they prefetch um, many messages and they have parallelism that allows the Dapper sidecar to deliver multiple messages at the same time via a fixed number of Go routines. So you can have parallelism even without uh, in subscription without necessarily having the batch uh, subscribe. Uh, so you want to call that out that that's one of the options supported today. So let's go back to the next slide. And they have an issue, of course, on the song. Next slide. Um, so batch publish. Uh, so we had some conversations here at Microsoft about uh, what do we mean by a batch publish? And uh, there are different interpretations of that. And that is mentioned in the issue as well. So if you open the issue, uh, there was a discussion on that. Um, so one of the scenarios is that the batch publish is transactional. What does it mean? It means that the batch of messages is delivered to the broker together and it cannot have partial success. Be either all or nothing, which means only a subset of the brokers would support it. It's a is a similar compare. If you can compare that to the stage store API, where you have the transactional API that only some um, stage store support. So that is one way that we want to support this because it's a legit scenario where um, applications do not want to have a partial success. Uh, it means that the act is per batch, not per message. So it's all or nothing. Um, of course, we have to send an array of cloud event objects. Uh, that will be part of the basic API of the batch publish. And for scenarios that require that are okay with a non-transaction variant, um, the batch terminology might have some ambiguity. So the proposal will be to have the batch API reserved for uh, transactional publish and have the bulk publish to be the one that you have acknowledgement per message and support partial failures. It, it's very similar comparison to the state store API that we have the bulk set and bulk get. So the terminology will also be compatible with that and, and reduce ambiguity uh, in interpretation. Um, and uh, we also have the batch subscribe where uh, it will not be transactional. So actually it should be called bulk subscribe uh, because it doesn't make sense for you to guarantee transaction on the application side. The application will, will publish, will, will support ACK or the whole batch of once or nothing. There'll be a really hard requirement on the application side to support that. So we believe that if we decided to go with the uh, batch subscribe, we should call it bulk instead and, and support uh, uh, to deliver multiple messages at once, again, using the cloud event object um, uh, abstraction. Uh, brokers, um, only brokers with prefetching, which means you cannot really support a batch delivery or bulk delivery to the application if the broker cannot do a prefetching of like 10 messages at a time or 20 messages at a time. So um, that will be that will be very uh, uh, something very interesting to very hard to do if you cannot have that support from the broker. Um, act per message. Um, we believe the act per message is the right thing to do because it will give uh, the right abstraction rather, it, no matter if the broker supports um, acknowledgement per message or per point in time in the queue. Like Kafka, you, you always move the needle of the whole um, 
like a section at a time. So it can move to like the pointer. In this case, the DAPA runtime, we the implementation of the component in DAPA runtime, we need to understand, okay, out of all these messages that I sent, the first 10 got in. Uh, so I can know how to move the middle, move the middle by 10 and, and ignore the, the rest and have at least once delivery guarantees. So uh, it's a little bit more, uh, it might be a little bit harder to implement, uh, but I think it will give the better abstraction to the application. Uh, so the apps can always acknowledge per message and let the component handle how to propagate the act to the component. Um, and last but not least, the subscribe, the regular subscribe, we already have that today, to be honest. And uh, some brokers already have this fully implemented with prefetched and individual delivery of messages with parallelism. Uh, the downside is that it's a component specific implementation. But if you think about that, the solution on top is also a component specific implementation. So I think no matter what, we're gonna need to have specifics on each component on how to handle batching. I don't think Dapper should be, the runtime should be in the business of uh, finding an adapter or an abstraction that will make a non-batch subscription become batch subscription. Um, I don't think that's feasible. Uh, maybe the publish is, is possible to have the bulk publish. Um, so that's the how we are going with the proposal. So please comment what you think on the issue. It's still open discussion. We haven't settled on this yet. Uh, we just had a, a discussion on this uh, within Microsoft. And we, of course, we're gonna compete, continue to have a discussion here within Microsoft as well, but the, your opinions on the issue, you are definitely be considered. Uh, Yadon raised the, raise the hand. Yeah, um, I've, I've heard several users actually asking for this uh, because of performance reasons, obviously. So I think this is uh, beneficial. Um, when you say for batch subscribe uh, and batch publish array of cloud events objects, is there a way we can support this for raw payloads? Um, there is there is this discussion. I have the discussion as well. The my opinion is that because the batch API is too specific, uh, and because we're receiving an array of objects, you have to enforce some sort of schema so you don't get just uh, uh, like binary data. It is if we really want, there are two solutions here. One, we could make that a SDK feature where the SDK itself will accept raw payload and wrap as a cloud event. Um, and we could also support the scenario where you receive a array of basic for encoded uh, uh, by uh, string. But I don't think that will give the value that the raw API does today which is you receive the event in the raw format that it was sent and the application just needs to um, uh, process the, the payload as is. Uh, if you need to do that, uh, you will need to use uh, the regular subscribe at the bottom and the regular publish because you have to somehow combine multiple payloads of arbitrary format into an array. So you need to put an opinion or a scheme on top of that. So that's that's how I'm thinking about this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, makes sense. We can continue the discussion there uh, on GitHub. Um, when you send subscribe existing existing functionality where messages are prefetched live individually and in parallel, uh, yeah, we do have that today. Um, but in, you know, the, the fact we deliver messages in parallel doesn't constitute as a batch subscribe. Yeah, it's not the same as batch subscribe. Um, it can't. What I try to say is you can get depending on your application, you can get the same performance gains as a batch subscribe by doing that. So- uh, Yeah, no, I, I think actually batch subscribes will always be more performant because even if we deliver messages in parallel, it's it's still, you know, the number of IO calls that are gonna be generated from the DAPR sidecar are equal to the number of events. Whereas with batch subscribe, you don't have a single IO call for N number of events. Yeah, that, but that is true. Uh, although if there might be some extra cost in, in wrapping the array, but yes, it, it is it is, um, it is a bigger payload to send over the wire too. But yes, I do, I do believe that the batch subscribe has chances of performing better. We would need to measure to see the difference. But uh, today you could have some of those gains already 
Um, but I think none of these are exclusive. It's not like an or story. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Dapper can support batch publish, bulk publish, uh, bulk subscribe. Uh, again, I'm avoiding the using the term batch here. And the regular subscribe, we can support all of that. Uh, and we also can deliver that incrementally. Each True. one of the deliverables is incrementally done. You don't need to support all of it at once. True, I, I agree. And for the bulk operations, we just need to be very clear that uh, these are non-transactional and that messages can actually get lost with these operations. Um, publish, uh, I don't think the message can be lost. I think the message can be delivered more than once. Well, in, in publish, um, if, if you try to publish a single message today and Dapper fails to write it to the bus, it'll return an error to the application and the application can retry. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, in, this, sorry? in this case, the same. So you're expecting the bulk API to basically like return a list of keys that failed? Yes. So that will, okay, yeah, that, that, that could work. I think you'll have to be clear over when to use this as opposed to single calls and the benefits of it. I mean, one, you talk about performance, but that's kind of always a fine line about where the performance starts and where it ends. So would you expect this to become the default method of using publishing? Um, I, I think I think it would be, depend on the scenarios, to be honest, and the speed of the broker. So um, it, it I, would also depend on whether or not the broker supports it, right? Because this oh yeah. is a per broker implementation. If, if the broker is the broker does not support, I think the only thing that the broker does need to support is the bulk publish. Well, yeah. we can we might be able to do a wrapper to adapt it and publish one message at a time and abstract to the application and, and stuff. But I think it has to do a lot with the with the broker and uh, uh, in, in difference in performance. Um, so, so I would so like I would like to see some numbers um, to see the the, the comparison. Yeah. So have a first POC of batch publish and yes. compare and compare uh, the results. My my concern with all of these things is like there's yet more choices you have to make now, and so you've now you know you started using publish API and now you have to change the API to batch publish API on certain brokers and you then have to make choices around that looks and it always gets tricky now to understand when to do that and how and how to assess it. But, yeah, okay. Well, let's open it up for any more questions in the last few minutes on this. Um, anyone would like to come and comment on the issue more? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, with that, we literally have two minutes for open discussion. I, unless anyone has a question that they can ask in the next minute, um, we can take it um, and publish it. You can write it in the chat window. Otherwise, I think we are really much out of time. Thank you for joining us on this call and we will see you in two weeks time and hopefully we'll kind of come up with a lot of new issues then. So thank you for joining us. And yeah, let, let me just say one more thing. Uh, Adam, I, I see you there. I think you want to talk about uh, gRPC examples for SPNet Core. Uh, we can certainly take a stab at that and, and see how we can provide with these examples. So I'll talk to you over at Discord. Okay, yes, great. Yes, any conversations like this, let's take it off onto Discord channel, pop it there and we'll keep it going. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.